Nations President Asafo Hene Efwa Abase Asari, esteemed guests and cherished members of Ahaspra Professionals Network, Amobaya Santwa Dagadu, Diaspora Engagement Coordinator of Ahaspra. As we gather here today to celebrate the 13th anniversary and embark on our third Diaspora Roundtable series, I extend heartfelt thanks to our event partners. Today's Diaspora Roundtable, in partnership with the GIZ Ghana, working on behalf of European Union, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. We also have GIZ, Beyond the Return, and GIPC for their instrumental support within the making of this roundtable. Ahaspra serves as a vital bridge, fostering connections, nurturing talent, and driving a positive change within our communities. Inspired by the vision of creating a platform for diaspora engagement and collaboration, Ahaspra has constantly worked towards empowering the African diaspora to, co to contribute meaningfully to the development of Ghana. Tonight, as we stand at this intersection of celebration and contemplation, let's embark on an, an enriching dialogue, exploring the theme, leveraging creative arts as a tool to propelling Ghana's brand. We are honored to have distinguished guest of honor, Ibrahim Mahama join us in conversation with Ahaspra's founder, Christabel E. Darzi. Mr. Mahama will share his reflections on the power of art in shaping identity and nationhood. Let's extend our gratitude and embrace tonight's discussion with open minds and compassionate hearts. To commence, let's kickstart by welc with some welcoming words from our esteemed event partners. So I would like to introduce Sylvia Tizi from the European Union. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased uh, to be here this evening for this uh, Diaspora Round Table. And uh, I want to be brief because uh, we are all here to interact with, to listen to this uh, amazing Ghanaian artist, Ibrahim Mama, and also Api Orkor. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for this opportunity. And um, a special thanks to uh, Aspara for organizing this uh, event. We have uh, followed with some of my colleagues uh, your uh, initiative in the past, uh, and uh, we are very glad that thanks to GIZ, uh, it was possible finally to, to support one of these Diaspora Roundtable. Um, so just a few words on the EU commitment on this topic, and especially on migration and uh, culture. So the, the EU in Ghana promote uh, an holistic approach to migration and we want to contribute to a positive narration. So uh, for us it's important to think together about how we can leverage the benefit of migration for development. And within this uh, reflection is what is exactly what we are doing in collaboration with uh, GIZ in several projects and initiatives, but especially in the Ghana European Center for uh, Jobs, Migration and Development. So as I say, the, the title of the, the name of the center, uh, also diaspora engagement is one of the pillar of this uh, partnership. And we are really glad to be here uh, today together. And uh, a second, another key area of intervention and uh, for us also a priority in relation to the, especially the EU youth strategy and the EU uh, action plan uh, for the youth is the support to the culture and creative industry. So maybe you have heard some of our initiative like the Black Star International Film Festival, uh, She Writes, uh, done on the 8th of uh, March for the women, with the women and for the women. And the Diffusion EU, the West Africa Artist Residency and the uh, Expo, just to mention a, a few of these initiatives. So as I say, just to be, to be brief, I'm I'm here to better understand really uh, which role the diaspora could play in promoting culture and creative sector in Ghana. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to listen to you and uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, hello and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's also a big pleasure being here tonight with all of you and to represent GIZ as we were approached by Ahas Ahaspura for this event as a partner, 
which uh, I'm extremely happy about. And uh, so, yeah, it's a great privilege and honor to be here with our distinguished guest tonight, Mr. Ibrahim Mahama, uh, the talented Ghanaian creative artist who has, through his vision and his work, also became a global icon. So I'm looking forward to our discussion. So Mr. Mahama himself, he is a very good example for Ghanaian diaspora because he has also leveraged his exposure to promote the creative arts sector and as a living example that diaspora members can make a valuable contribution to the social and economic development of Ghana. Because worldwide diaspora communities serve as a vital bridge connecting us to a vast reservoir of knowledge, skills and networks. Therefore, an active diaspora engagement and engagement of diaspora communities is an invaluable resource for economic and social development. Strongly believing in this potential, supporting the engagement of the Ghanaian diaspora is one of our key pillars within the program that GIZ is implementing as part of the German Development Co Cooperation and also with our European partners from the EU delegation, as Sylvia has outlined. Hereby, we have had the privilege to serve as a key partner also on the journey of developing and launching the diaspora engagement policy last year, which is also providing a robust framework for diaspora engagement in Ghana. Furthermore, we have supported the socioeconomic involvement of entrepreneurs, creatives, and investors. Make remittances work is one example to engage diaspora members in entrepreneurship and how to use remittances to start and running businesses. It's a useful tool, especially for women or men who receive remittances and are interested in investing in businesses or other long-term investments. Um, through another innovative approach, which aims to channel remittances of the Ghanaian diaspora into investments of small and micro businesses, Vidu Africa has mobilized more than 3 million euros of funds from the diaspora for small businesses. More than 1,100 entrepreneurs have received financial support and benefited from business coaching that accompanies them on their growth journey, creating additional income and securing more than 2,300 jobs in all regions of Ghana. Within this framework of diaspora engagement activities, we are delighted about this specially curated uh, session to highlight the role of the creative arts in a nation branding, amplify Ghana as the cultural capital on the global stage, and discuss partnerships for bridging gaps between creative artists in Today's roundtable is intended to look into the multifaceted aspects of diaspora engagement to promote knowledge sharing and foster collaboration. Through the partnership with the diaspora, we hope to further increase the dialogue with the diaspora and the opportunities for engagement. And now I need to turn to the next page. <laughs> so, yeah, but actually I could have done the last part also freely, but <laughs> so for all Ghanaians living abroad, and that your knowledge, your experience and your skills to share them with generations in Ghana. So therefore, in this context, I would like to quote Barack Obama, who said, partnerships like these remind us that the relationship between nations is not just defined by governments, but it's defined by people. And that's what we are all here for today. And I wish you all a very interesting and enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. So we express, uh, Hasbro expresses immense appreciation to our partners, GIZ, working on behalf of the European Union and the, general, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Nearly got tongue tied there, so forgive me. So we will continue on and have Annabelle McKenzie from Beyond the Return give us a few words so please, put your hands together. 
Good evening, everyone. So my staff wrote a long speech, but I'm really not a speech person. So I kind of wrote my own notes and I'll stick to this. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I love coming to diaspora panels. Um, it's very important for Beyond the Return. Um, so just a little bit about Beyond the Return. We fall under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, and my office is at Ghana Tourism Authority. So Ghana Tourism Authority is the coordinator of Beyond the Return, and I'm the director of the Secretariat. Beyond the Return is built on seven foundational pillars, but tonight I will focus on the four pillars that really have something to do with the creative arts industry. So if you look at Brand Ghana, with that pillar, we want to own our own narrative and tell our own stories in Ghana. We don't want the West and other people to tell our stories. And so we do a lot with the creative arts industry to ensure stories are getting out. And I see a lot of great people from the industry here tonight that we work closely with. We also have Celebrate Ghana. Ghana has rich traditions and cultures and is to be celebrated. So we encourage people to come visit Ghana to go to festivals. We encourage them to go pound fufu, to actually get out in the community and learn about Ghana. Ghana is more than parties in December, even though it is a fun time. And we also have the Invest in Ghana pillar. In order for the creative arts industry to grow, we need investment. And that is very important for the ministry. We work closely with DIPC to bring investments for the creative arts industry. So one of one big program that we have happening in June is the first inaugural West Africa music music and arts festival. We're actually doing that in partnership with Warner Music. We're bringing out a lot of key executives. We will have a lot of local Ghanaians to talk about what is going on in the creative industry. We'll also have master classes. There'll be a concert for up and coming artists. So we think it's key to really invest in creative arts. Um, National Film Authority is also um, doing a few different things to bring investment to creative arts. They have their Shoot in Ghana initiative, and they're also trying to implement a tax initiative to make Ghana more attractive for international investors to shoot their films in Ghana. Finally, the pillar that everyone knows about is Experience Ghana. That's where all the events fall. That's where December and GH is. And quite frankly, everyone thinks my office is only about events, but we do a lot of work outside of that. So the creative arts industry is very important to us and we will always support it because it has a great role in telling the story of Ghana. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Apioko. So I'm going to share a poem with you. It's inspired by tonight's event and it's titled Banners of Art. Now when you think of a banner, what do you think of? Hey, well, art, but apart from that, what does a banner do? There's one behind me. Information, it's communications, you know, especially if you're a brand. So let's talk about banners of art. Ago, ago. I'm the royal town crier. I'm the queen of my poetic woman queendom. I'm the goddess of poetic African savannas, jungles, rivers, and oceans. I am the lioness. I am the tigress. And I am the Ghanaian mermaid. I'm the matriarch of modern poetic nations. I'm poetry incarnate. And my pen fears no man, no woman, no child, no beast, no plague. Forget the muse. I am the muse. Yes, they rabbi sold I to the merchant ships. <sighs> Beneath the wide expanse of the Saharan sky, where the echoes of the past blend with whispers of the future, Ghana stands, a beacon in its heartbeats rhythmic and bold. Here, the colors tell stories in hues that dance under sunbeams. Vivid, alive, narratives woven into the fabric of our daily activities, and we lay dismembered in stripes, 
of strips of red, gold, and green, where the ink of the potent black star spills across us and then bathes us until we are simply forgotten shadows trapped in an untrapped rays of darkness. But out of the shadows of darkness, we scream because we are many black stars which culminate into one enormous black star. And our black star's five points are daggers that know how to fight over overpowering shadows and to pierce through suffocating darkness. Even in our pain, we are banners of art. From the bustling streets of Tamale to the serene shores of Cape Coast, the clatter of looms merge with the whispers of waves. Artists breathe life into clay, into paint, into words. Their creations more than mere craft, a conduit of culture, a testament of time. In the shadows of the ancient forts, history speaks murmurs of resilience, tales of sorrow and triumph, while the modern Gollywood, hello Gollywood, lights up the screens with tales anew, visual anthems of identity, diversity, unity, cinematic symphonies that travel, resonate, and inspire. But we lay dismembered in stripes and strips of red, gold, and green, while the ink of the potent black star spills across us and then bathes us until we are simply forgotten shadows, trapped in trapped rays of darkness. But out of the shadows of darkness, we scream because we are many black stars which culminate into one enormous black star. And our black star's five points, they are daggers that know how to fight overpowering shadows of darkness and how to pierce through suffocating darkness. Even in our pain, we are banners of art. The scent of frying plantain. Kilewele. Where's Crystal? She likes Kilewele. <laughs> like, who doesn't? That scent mingles with the ocean breeze. A culinary masterpiece on every street corner. You name it. Kinke, Wache, Hausa, Koko, and Kose, Banku, Tozafi. Each dish is a palette of flavors, a diverse palette of people. From the northern savannas to the coastal lagoons, Ghana's gastronomy, another verse in our cultural ode. And yet we lay dismembered in stripes and strips of red, gold, and green while the ink of the potent black star spills across us. And then it bathes us until we are simply forgotten shadows, trapped in trapped rays of darkness. But out of the shadows of darkness, we scream because we are many black stars which culminate into one enormous black star. And our black star's five points, they are daggers that know how to fight overpowering shadows and to pierce through suffocating darkness. Because even in our pain, we are what? Banners of art. Poets. Painters musicians, custodians of heritage, each note played, each line drawn, each word penned. It's the stitch in the fabric of Ghana's global tapestry, crafting a brand that transcends borders where tradition and innovation are the loom and the thread. And yet, we lay dismembered in stripes and strips of red, gold, and green, while the ink of that potent black star, what does it do? It spills across us. It bathes us until we are simply forgotten shadows, trapped in trapped rays of darkness in a global conversation. But I said out of darkness we scream because we are many black stars, which culminate into one enormous black star and our black star's five points. They know how to pierce through suffocating darkness. Even in our pain, we are banners of art. And so as the kente cloth wraps around the shoulders of the world, and the magical fugu drapes portraits of new African civilizations, let each color, each pattern, each texture remind us that we are builders of bridges. We are architects of understanding. And through our creative arts, we propel Ghana, not just as a country, but as a story, enduring, vivid, profound. So we must not lay dismembered in stripes and strips of red, gold, and green. We must not allow the potent black star to simply paint us with ink as though it had no meaning and bathe us until we are simply forgotten shadows trapped in trapped rays of darkness around the world. Out of the shadows of darkness, we scream because we are many black stars which culminates into one enormous black star and oh, our black stars five points don't they know that they are daggers that know how to pierce through 
overpowering shadows, how to pierce through suffocating darkness, how to pierce through oblivion. Because even in our pain, we are banners of art. And so, So emancipate yourself from mental slavery. It's none but ourselves can free our minds. You can sing along. Have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop at the time. How long shall they kill our prophets? While we stand aside and look. Oh, some say part of it we've got to fulfill the book won't you help me sing help me sing these songs of freedom is all I ever had redemption songs these songs of freedom Redemption songs, redemption songs. Even in our pain, we are banners of art. Thank you. Because I always tell people that I don't need a jet. I just need my friends to have one and I'll sit in the front seat. That is my goal in life. And so I am blessed to have friends who are in high places doing amazing things and they make time for me to live out this dream of celebrating the diaspora, telling our stories, building partnerships and investments through engaging conversations. So after Akriyoko came and blew us away, I can only try to keep you awake. That will be my job. And I will do it by telling a story. So I was telling people that before I used to script, like I'm a very, I'm a planner, right? So I would script, like literally, like type up my speech word for word. Then I realized that it just makes me nervous. So these days I write notes. I literally have notes that I wrote when I got inspiration by looking at Ibrahim's face when he arrived here. So we're going to have literally that a conversation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not know Ibrahim Mahama, look him up. But the problem about looking him up is you may find the wrong Ibrahim Mahama. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look him up, go to the pictures and then click on the one that looks like him and you can read about him. I'm not going to do a formal intro introduction. Ibrahim is under 40 and I say it with pride because usually I'm the youngest in the room and I love it. And I'm a last born, so I love it when I'm older than somebody, so I will say it. Um, he is under 40, an amazing young Ghanaian artist. And today we will talk about his journey. So Ibrahim, first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I say thank you because he flew in yesterday for me. So I really, really appreciate him being here. <laughs> So Ibrahim, let's pretend as if nobody is here and have a chat. Is that okay? Sure, let's do that. So like I said, my name is Christabel. Who are you? Uh, I'm Ibrahim. Mm. My full name is actually Muhammad Ibrahim okay. Mahama. Yeah, but I, uh, when I, I think this was in uni, I dropped the Muhammad. Ah. And I started using just Ibrahim Mahama. Got it. Yeah. At the time, uh, Ibrahim Mahama from Engineers and Planners was not very visible. So I didn't really think so much about it right but later on that came You're to like, my detriment mm. <laughs> <laughs> that the came good to thing detriment. is he's doing good things too of so course, we'll take of it course. yes yes <laughs> yeah excellent so ibrahim i'm gonna start all the way back yeah. right let's take you to primary school tell us a bit about your childhood story what was it like where did you go to school where did you grow up and what was it like um yeah, thank you i i grew up in accra I, I was born in 87. Um, I came from a very big family. I come from a very big family, actually. My father has four wives and um, uh, 10 biological children. Um, my mother is a second wife. At the age of two, where we moved to Accra, that's the nuclear family, my mother and my four siblings. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we lived in Accra since. 
uh, we were sent to various boarding schools. I don't know why. Maybe you ask my parents, they'll tell you. Uh, we went to Prince Boatin Memorial in Nsawom. Okay. Those days, it was very risky to go on that road. Uh, if you're lucky, if you got to the school alive, the road was very bad. And um, yeah, I went to a school in, um, what's in, uh, Joe Lukovic Hans, okay. and then to Hans Preparatory. Oh, so that was behind my mother's house. Yeah, exactly. And then I found myself in uh, St. John's Preparatory in Achimota, a boarding school. I was five years old. Uh, with my sister and we're there till I was uh, 12 mm. and then we moved uh, from I moved from there to another school called Star Avenue and then uh, from there it was secondary school and my father was very insistent that I studied art yeah because uh, when I was a child in boarding school I used to draw a lot okay. I liked drawing I, I hated being in boarding school and for some reason drawing was the only thing that kept me at peace mm. so um yeah my father said and you know i was the one of the last children and i always like to joke that my father had already seen some kind of uh, promise and success in the family so being the last child they, they could take any risk so my father said oh yeah maybe this one can become an artist uh let's see what becomes of it um yeah so i went on to KNUSD to study painting and sculpture and that was it. I kept on studying for the master's degree and then later went back to do the PhD in painting again. Amazing. Yeah. A kid from the north came to the south, went to like four or five different primary schools. Yes. <laughs> um, and then went on to secondary school. And then your father said you could draw. You actually beat me to my next question, which was going to be, what did you tell daddy? And how did you tell him that you wanted to be an artist? But it seems daddy had foresight. Oh, he did. I think one of the, the interesting things is that when I went to secondary school, I went to Pope John uh, Secondary at the time. And I, at the time when I was going to school, I had chosen visual arts as a program. But later, I went back to change it. And my, my family wasn't very happy about it. Mm. So I had to, the, the, school, uh, the school that I had chosen was St. Peter's. Two okay. of my brothers had gone there. And I had one brother who was in Pope John. And my father wanted me to go to Pope John because they had visual arts and St. Peter's they didn't have. Got it. And we were trying to change it. But uh, when the results came, St. Pope John wouldn't take me because I'd chosen St. Peter's. So it was a long going back and forth. So I had to right. wait. I sat home for almost a term. And eventually I got admission to Pope John. I think at the time it was the principal of uh, Kofodia Polytechnic. He was a friend of an uncle of mine who helped us to get it. So I went to school very late. Mm. And then when I went to school even it was not possible to get into the visual arts class because at the time, the school had admitted how many students? Our class was supposed, we, they only had one visual arts class and all the other courses had like three classes or whatever, science, arts, business, and visual arts only had one. And the class could contain 40 students, but then there were 140 people who had been admitted into the class. So the headmaster said, it's not possible. I can't really do anything. I can't add any other person to the classroom. So I used to go to his office to harass him because each time I call my father on the pay phone, my father's like, so are you doing the arts? I'm like, no. So, and one time when I went to the head, he was tired of me. So he said, look, if you can find someone in the class who can swap with you, I will do you that favor. So I went to the visual arts class to announce. I did a public announcement. <laughs> and there were, you know, there are always people who end up in the visual arts class because in Ghana, you don't really, if you don't, your grades are not good, they put you in the arts class. So there was already someone waiting for me to come and make this announcement. So there was one guy who didn't want to be in the class. Right. So he immediately opted to swap with me. So that was the day I ended up becoming an artist. <laughs> wow, amazing. Quite the go-getter you are. It started at an early age. Excellent. Please, you can clap. Feel free. <laughs> so I, I was going to give a little bit of context for those who are not from Ghana. And to say also, welcome to those who are online. Thank you so much for joining from around the world. We did want to get make sure everybody can hear this conversation. And what is most important for us at the Haspra is that a young person sees Ibrahim and says, I can also do visual arts. Yes. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so you started early, too noon, as we like to call yes. you, right? Um, <laughs> and in Ghana, there's different tiers of school. So St. Peter is a first tier, St. Peter's is a first tier school. And you can't decide a third tier school and want to so it's 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 a, it's a big John mess. Pop John is first too. Oh, so it's two first, so even exactly. worse, actually. So it's like how dare you compare the two um and, and do that. So he did essentially kind of all the wrong things, still went in, 
and then mm-hmm. demanded what he wanted. That yes. is excellent. Yes. Um, what we do have in common is that I, they put me for science, okay. and I cried my heart out, so they moved me. <laughs> so I did it a different way. But it's great to have those um, educational conversations because they really shape who you are. Yeah. And if you hadn't done visual arts, or if I had stayed in science, we probably wouldn't be here today. So, you know, go for your dream, definitely. Thank you so much. Okay, so then we went to secondary school and you did visual arts. And so that is when the talent started being built. Yes. Then you said you went on to KNUSD. Did I get that right? That's yes. Kwame Nkrumah uh, University of Science and Technology. Yes. Tell us about the experience in university. Hello, yes. So I think in 1962, uh, the painting and sculpture program had been created. And there were three students that signed up for the program. Um, subsequently, there were many other students that went through the program. Uh, artists like Professor Glover, he did textiles at the university, but later on became uh, migrated his, uh, his knowledge and skill from textile into painting. Um, but the program, for a long time, because it was based on the hand and eye, the old British curriculum, it was quite very conservative because uh, a lot of students, it was mostly about subjects of representation, even when you were making work within the academy, there was it was very formal in terms of what you could do. So there was a group of professors who had studied in the same academy, like Professor Karikacha, Castro, Buma. Some of them had gone elsewhere to study. Some of them had been teaching in the same university. But they were aiming to transform the program because um, in our own history, Ghana has been through quite a lot in terms of material forms, material decays, material transformation and all that. But when it came to art practice within the university, Mostly it was reduced down to the material of painting. Or if you're a sculptor, you had to use metal or um, what's the name? Um, uh, carving, stone carving, wood carving, and things like that. And there are a lot of great artists, of course, within the 20th century who had practiced and all that. But the question was that how do we further push art beyond what it is, beyond what we inherited, particularly during the 20th century? So that's what we met at KNUSC at the time. So there was, we're in a... We're, we're, I went to school at a time when this renaissance was happening. Okay. So the question we were asking ourselves was that, were we willing to be part of this new renaissance or some people who were who said to themselves, oh no, like because I came from secondary school and I used to paint. I used to make figurative work. And some people say, oh no, but you know, uh, artists about being able to, to be true to the subjects of the human body, blah, blah, blah. Well, I just say, oh no. Um, artists more or less about uh, new self-discoveries, trying out things, letting them fail, using failure as a starting point. So there were different schools of thought. Uh So I think that's where my journey begins in terms of somehow the struggle between trying to become an artist and also at the same time trying to become an artist that is able to live off the work that they produce. Interesting. And that part, we're going to stay right there. Yeah. Because I have a personal story of my very own mother who wanted to be an artist. And her dad, he didn't beat her because he doesn't beat people, but he literally beat it out of her mind. She became an amazing lawyer, but she still uses her hands. She sews. Nobody taught her how to sew. She makes wedding dresses. You know, and we feel like she could have used that art actually to go somewhere else. But in our culture, it's getting better. (laughs) But being an artist, making money, tell us about that a little bit, please. Unpack it. Uh, Well, for me, I never, to be honest with you, up until almost nine years ago, when I started working more professionally as an artist, I never thought of making art as a, it wasn't a profession in my Mm. mind. It wasn't a career. I did it because I loved it so much. I couldn't live without it, you know. Um, uh, I recently got married to my very beautiful wife. Please, Um, wait. (laughs) Where's our wife? There she is. (laughs) Yeah, though she's always saying that she has to compete with my work. Um, yeah, but I can't help it because it had always been my first true love. Like, it's it's like I can't really live, I can't live without it. Thoughts and ideas, like when when I'm in bed and I have ideas, I have to wake up and write. Like, mm. sometimes you have sleepless nights because you feel like there are things that are haunting you. And uh, for me, that was what it was in secondary school. When I was in secondary school, you know, in the curriculum in Ghana, which they haven't revised very much, you don't do photography in secondary school as a program. Even painting like uh, as a program, you only use postal colors. When I was in school, I had to like uh, buy gouache, oil uh, paints. There was a shop in Accra. They used to sell this uh, painter's oil. Amsterdam, De La Roni, and all these things. I used to buy them because my father was very 
interested in how I could somehow master these materials. So I, my teacher who was in secondary school, Mr. Osei at the time, he used to give me private tuition on some of these things because I used to say to myself, I wouldn't want to go to university and then now still be learning how to mix oil and things like that, mm. you know? So for me, it was, I, I wanted to understand what the medium of art itself was. So when I, in 2000 and, um, when was it? 2014, there was an, a big exhibition in, um, in, in London at the Saatchi Gallery. And if you know art, the history of art, Charles Saatchi, he's this big Iranian collector who had a publishing firm, uh, Saatchi and Saatchi. And he invested into a lot of artists in England, the YBAs, the young British artists. And they blew up quite, they blew up significantly, mm -hmm. like most of the prominent artists practicing today. So there's a gallery that he built in London called the Saatchi Gallery and did a lot of prominent exhibitions in there. So we were in school, we studied about all these things. But mind you, the generation before us, even when you're talking about exhibitions, the Venice Biennale, Documenta, all the very significant exhibitions that put artists on a global map, it was almost impossible to find Ghanaian artists who were practicing mm -hmm. here who were, who were on those platforms. Mm -hmm. Because the thing was that when you made painting, the idea of the painting was that it had to be a commodity, something that you could sell. So if you made a painting, what's the use of making a painting if no one can buy the painting? Mm -hmm. So when you made a painting and tourists came in, most of, because we didn't have institutions and we hadn't invested into it, the only institution that existed was the uh, National Museum, which was being built by Nkrumah, which was abandoned in 1966. And uh, the collection, the archive, everything was somehow deteriorating and all that. So hotels started providing their lobbies for artists to use for exhibitions and all that. So as a painter, you make your painting, it ends up in a lobby. If a tourist comes, he buys it, he can roll it off the canvas and then transport it. So at the end of the day, that was the question that we were asking ourselves as artists. How do we go beyond this? So I didn't want to make this kind of work because when I was a student, I had seen how much it went because people would commission you to make portraits of their wives, their girlfriends, their families, things like, and I did quite enough of that, but I didn't really think that is what art really was because the question about art is not what exists, but it's about what can become. It's always a, that, like, there's always something that we are looking for. It's like freedom. We don't really understand what freedom, we're always in search of some freedom out there. So I, for me, that's where that thing really came from. Like, can we make work differently that can also transform? So it's not so much about commodifying things, mm -hmm. but it's about main, making things that go beyond the commodity. So if I, like I make works today, like uh, large installations, like I did the Barbican quite recently. So we were commissioned by the Barbican together with like a collector in America. And then I worked with over a thousand people in Tamale to weave the smoke fabric. I rented a stadium in Tamale and, and we worked with them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I worked with the, the, the over a thousand people and then we had to sew everything by hand because the idea was that we had to look beyond. Because normally when you see a material on that large scale, you think, oh, it's been done by a machine, but I mm. really wanted it to be done by hand because I was also looking at the dialogue between the work in terms of the labor and the Barbican itself as a post-war architecture, something that was built with a, a lot of it, like uh, human intense labor, even okay. like the texture of the building and all that. So together with all the other works that I've done were like works on paper or like um, sculptures and others. Some of them are so big, but then it takes very specialized institutions to buy those works. It's not just a work that you can buy. You need to be invested in the work itself because the work is made up of historical materials. So as in our predecessors, where maybe you would have made a painting, it's hanging, someone would buy it, they'll go and hang it on a wall. This time around, the work goes directly into an institution mm -hmm. and it goes directly into display. So it means that if you go to some of the top museums in Europe, you'd find the work prominent within the museum. Whereas if the work was something portable, someone could just buy it and put it in their living room. But what point is there in buying a work of art if people cannot experience it? So we had to shift that idea that we have to make work that actually the public can experience. So that goes a long way even to like red clay in Tamale and why I started building these institutions to further find ways in which we could democratize art and find ways in which it could somehow change the value, mm -hmm. the intrinsic, mm -hmm. one, the intrinsic value mm -hmm. and two, the value value of the work. Because right. a lot of these works, they are so rare that already the value, because it's made with those kinds of materials, the value is already here. Fine, yeah. Whereas if you're making it as a, it's like, it's a factory, you're producing work in a factory. Things that are produced in a factory are mostly not valuable. 
because there are so many of them. Mm. Uh-huh. Mm. But then if you're making a work because the work is personal and there's a very particular story to it, right. regardless of how difficult it is, there is always an institution somewhere that wants the work. And that's where the value comes in. This is it. You know, you yeah. just talked about hard work. You talked about passion. Yeah. You talked about consistency, perseverance. And then that leads to something that somebody will always buy. If there's a young person listening to us today, it doesn't come overnight. It takes all of these things and it will become something that is worthwhile. Really appreciate this because a lot of the times in our world today, people want it quick. You know, it's on social media and then they'll see Ibrahim. Ibrahim is 37. He's putting pink in gray skies of London. I need it today, tomorrow. And then I get frustrated when it doesn't happen. It takes time. It takes effort. So I'm going to take you backwards a little bit because I'll come back to the global piece. I'm blown away by you. And here's why. I mean, who wakes up in the morning and puts sacks on National Theater? <laughs> like, I, what? And, and you actually think that is something. And I remember it so well. I was like randomly driving. So the National Theater is actually very close to this place. Randomly driving some years ago. And he just reminded me it was 2016, right? And then the whole theater had gray, brownish kotoku sack, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> Your mind is special. Unpack your mind for me a little bit. I know I took you from KNUSC and we've gone to UK. Bring us back to Ghana. When you put those sacks, and I'll come to the train, so don't go to the trains yet. (laughs) No, the sacks, um, I think I was in uh, uni. Um, Yeah, I think this was my, I was going to my second year of uh, master's. One day I decided to buy a ticket and go to Burkina Faso. I had a friend who had come to visit after uni on exchange program, and I hadn't seen her in a long time with her family, so I thought I'd go visit them. So I bought a ticket with STC, and I started this journey. And it took forever, as you know, with the state transport to get to this place. And uh, But it was safe, though. Uh, we got to the border of uh, the Paga border, and we are there for so long, I didn't understand why. And that was the first time I had encountered, I took notice of these trucks that transport onions and other things across mm-hmm. the border. There were so many of them there. And I was already using this material in my work. Because, you know, historically, artists, even in a time, I think during the 80s, when there was a crisis with materials and other artists used to take the jute sack and then they would, put, they would sew it together and then they would, put some, they would stretch it over the, like, the stretcher. And they used it, they used it as, as a material for painting. Uh-huh. But at the time when I experienced this material, with the way it had been inhabited by these commodities, it, I, it, there, there was something special about it, you know. Further, when I came back to Ghana, I went to the market to further examine these materials, the ones that the onion sellers are using, uh, maize sellers, and I realized that they were writing their names on top of it, things like that. Then I went on to the charcoal market. I realized that a lot of them were tattered. They still had the names and things written on it. Even some of them, they had used the back of trees to restitch them up. So the material almost began looking like the body, like a body that was scarred in a way. So then I started thinking about it. What would it be if we suddenly... Hold on, hold on, hold on. It looks like a body that was scarred (laughs) out. Yeah, it's imaginative. Because when you see a material, that's the thing about art. Uh That's why they always say that artists are crazy or mad. It's not because we are mad. It's because there are things about the world that we see that ordinarily, because we are moving so fast in the world, you don't have the time to see that. But we are artists, that is what we were built for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to look at those things and to pay attention to them and to read new meanings out of it. So I was like, oh, this looks like a scarred body. It's quite very interesting. What would happen if we worked with people to stitch so many thousands of this together and for instance, just drape it on a, on a structure or building? What would it look like? Mm -hmm. It starts off just with a question. Sometimes with a very stupid question. Why would it be if I covered the whole building with these sacks? And I'm like, okay, sure, let's try and see what we can do about it. So then I started collaborating with people. So I started going to the markets, also doing research into the history of migration, like mm-hmm. with the uh, even post-slavery, looking at people migrating to the south, economic migrations, the building of the railway, uh, the, the mining sector, the cola plantations, cocoa, all these things. And then looking at it in relation to the Kaya's post-independent uh, pro- policies that Nkrumah was trying to create that could somehow turn the tides of Ghana in terms of economic prosperity, things like that. So looking at those, and also looking at the fact that 
they, these bags that I'm working, that I was interested in, they are largely produced in India and Bangladesh, and they are brought to Ghana. Mm. Uh -huh. And a lot of these are stored, they are, they, the cocoa is stored in these bags. But originally, the silos, for instance, when you go to Tema, they have the good, the big uh, CPC, Valco. Those were the buildings that were built actually for storage of cocoa, things like that. So you're looking at the void within those spaces versus looking at the void within the bag. What happens when you take a bag that was once used to contain cocoa and now used for charcoal and the charcoal is no longer in it? There's a void within it. But then the void is not, it's not gone. It's somehow there. So by covering it on a building, now there's a relationship between architecture in terms of its residue capital in relation to the material. So that's where the idea came from. So I thought, okay, let me start from somewhere. So I started going to the market spaces, talking to the charcoal sellers to let me cover their charcoal and other things. And a lot of them thought I was some kind of a, a scammer, <laughs> like a froster, like a four one a Sakawa boy or something yes. like that. Because I remember one, this is a true story. There's a woman in my neighborhood who has a charcoal business and she knows my mother very well. And she knows that I, I like, they know that our family, we like, they say we like going to school. And she knows I had been like, I'd, like done my, I was doing my, finishing my master's at the time. And I kept going to her, trying to get some sacks from her, you know. And one time she just stopped me and said, what are you doing, my son? And I said, what do you mean? She said, your mother has labored so much to send you to school. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> why wouldn't you find some good job to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, you don't aim to convince people. They have to see. Yeah, so... I, I told her one day you'll understand what I'm doing. Yes, but though I was even giving them new sacks in exchange of the old. So I did that. And then when I did some of the first installations, they still, it wasn't convincing. I went on to do other things. And then eventually I did the KNUST, um, the museum. I covered all the tropical modernist buildings in the campus. And mm -hmm. that was around the time when I applied. There's a, this company, um, Trasaco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were building some things uh, opposite the Flagstaff House. Okay. Uh, and then also behind uh, the Aurora and some other projects. So I applied. They gave me the permit to engage with the buildings uh, artistically. And also I had written to the National Theatre. And then they were very excited about it. The director was very positive about the project. Yeah. So um, I, I decided to do the project. But that's where the fun was, actually. It's not so much about... Yeah, the, the making of it, because at the time I had to like uh, employ a lot of guys who were working scaffolders on building sites. Um, some, a lot of guys who were in the market who were not working, the Kais and others. I think there were about uh, 300 or 400 of us. So we went mm -hmm. to the National Theatre and we gave ourselves three days to install the entire work. Whereas maybe in Europe, it would have taken, let's say, two months to install a building like that because you would have needed a range of so many uh, yeah, safeguards. Yeah. yeah, there is a famous uh, artist couple, Christo and Jean Claude. They did a lot of these projects, and sometimes it would take them forty years to get a permit. Mm. Whereas in Ghana, I would have gotten the permit, let's say, unless the people just didn't want it to happen. But if they wanted it to happen, sometimes it was just a matter of let's say providing TNT for certain people. I remember with the fire department. They, they were very skeptical about it. But all they wanted was like uh, breakfast and lunch and things like that. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, no, but uh, there are, sometimes I've always said that in, uh, it's like a lot of things, good things happen in Europe, but sometimes there are too many policies that also yeah. already hinder a lot Absolutely. of creativity and forms that happen. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's the beauty of also working from this part of the world, that because we are still trying to build on some of these systems, it allows their little loopholes that allows for you to be able to do a project that maybe if you were in Europe, it would have taken you a lifetime in order to realize that. Absolutely, Ibrahim. And thank you so much for bringing that up. This is why we encourage the return. Ghana mm -hmm. works. People, it does. <laughs> I tell you, you know, we have a conversation around, oh, there are no systems here. And I, I used to say it to myself. I actually stopped that storyline. But I would tell people, you know, I was in the U.S. I had a great job. And I lived in an apartment where the electricity would always be on. If I paid my bills, everything worked. Ghana doesn't work. No. Ghana works. We have a system. The system is called whom you know. That is our system. So if you're coming to Ghana, figure it out. Honestly, I, I, I will call out my brother here who just came from the U.S. He has an event. I'll mention his name. He's looking at me. You know? <laughs> Sorted. Why? He called me. It works, people, and we should leverage it. 
to be honest with you, it's, it's a system. You know, you can come sit in your corner and complain or you can figure out the gun away and it works, right? I'm not saying pay bribe. It's not that one. I'm saying whom you know, get to know them. Yeah. All right. So Ibrahim, thank you so much. You were able to cover National Theater with sacks in days, but then you did the same thing in the UK, but that didn't take that long, no? It took long. It took five weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Because right. the Barbican is a very protected building. It's one of the most protected buildings in the world. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, the work was, it was, it was, um, it was a case of engineering mm. because when I had the idea about the work conceptually first, secondly, it was how to get it realized. Right. So we had to work with an engineering company in the UK in order to engineer the work itself. So they had to design they had to give me measurements, specific measurements of the building, mm. how to cut the fabric, how to sew it, the layers to how to layer the material and all that. So we're working with those engineering plants in Tamale. So first we wove the material, we did the stitching, and then we had to restitch it. And then we had to buy fishing nets from the those that, that sell to the fishing uh, folks. And then we had to layer the entire material with fishing nets to make it a lot stronger. Because normally this is material that you use for clothing. Mm. It's not meant to be blowing in the exactly. air. Exactly. And you know the UK weather is very bad. Very bad. Also. So it's, uh, it doesn't really help at the end of the day also. Right. So the, we had to, and the Barbican is also quite special because when the building, because of the way it was built, when air goes into the building, it turns into some kind of a, tan, a funnel system. It, it, it moves around and it can rip things apart. Mm. So they had to consider all those in the engineering aspect of the work. Excellent. Wow. And you carried them to the UK. Yeah, so, yeah. please. In Ghana, we don't talk about money, but I'm going to talk about money. This should be very, very, very expensive, right? It is expensive, but the how institution did, actually, the okay. institution paid for everything. Oh. Yeah. So, I also, at the time, the last couple of weeks, I've been traveling a lot. I was doing teaching in South Africa. So, I couldn't be there at the time. So two of my studio assistants had to go ahead of time in order to work with the engineers to start the installation of the work. And then closer to the date, I think um, two weeks before the opening, that's when I arrived and then we completed. Even a week to the opening, we had to stop installing because there was a massive storm in Europe and it was really not helping. So we had to stop the work mm. until the day before. Wow. That's when we're lucky enough, the wind went down and then we're able to finish the installation for photos for the press amazing amazing all right ibrahim let's come back to ghana the trains the first time i met you you told me the story about trying to get trains to your people because they had never seen trains before can you unpack that story to the audience here for me please and the trains it was always uh i was always very passionate about it i remember do this what was what this i think this was in 2013 when i started discovering one of the first spaces that I covered with the Jutsats was the railway space uh, in Kumasi, Asafo. They have this locomotive workshop with a turntable. And I used to go there because when you're driving over the bridge, you see it all the time. So I was curious. I went there and I met the area manager at the time. Uh, he was an engineer who had studied also at KNUSD, Quick Green. And uh, I went to tell him that, oh, I wanted to come and cover the bridge with uh, Jutsats. And he was very, he was like, hey, this gentleman. Uh, but it was like, you say you are talking about art, but then what is, like, he wanted to know, see the artwork. Mm. But I was telling him that, oh, the covering is the art and blah, blah, blah. So he was very curious. So he gave me the permit. And then also he said I could use different parts of the railway. So there were some trains that were broken down, which I went to fix. Uh, we, we, I, I, I fixed, I, we covered it with the jute sacks and others. So subsequently, some of my colleagues did an exhibition at the same space. Uh, it was titled, If You Love Me. And um, they, there was one of the overhead cranes, which had been broken down for almost, um, I think, 20 years. It wasn't working. And they wrote a letter. The department, our department helped them with a letter and then to uh, Takra, they were the railway headquarters. They wanted one thing. They wanted parts that could help fix the crane that was in Kumasi working because they wanted to lift this train that was had an accident so they could install an artist's works in it. It was part of the vision of the exhibition. And then it was approved. So this engineer, Quigri, he at the time, he had been promoted and he had come to Accra as the area manager and then he went back to Second D. He was from, he was a fan, he was from Second D. And he was then the chief mechanical engineer. And at the railway, the chief mechanical engineer, like the engineers, because it's, a, it's an engineering field, so he had a lot of will. So he's the one that actually gave 
them the, uh, the, the he approved it mm-hmm. and then they removed part of working tr- uh, cranes and they brought it to Kumasi and fixed this crane which actually started working again almost 20 years it took an art exhibition to make that happen and then they lifted the train with the artist's work after the exhibition i think they took the mach- the parts back to so at the time i was asking myself is it possible to actually get access to these objects to these trains and other things i had applied i was doing a show in manchester tied to the parliament of ghosts and i wanted to take one of the trains from ghana to manchester in, and install it within a gallery and all that at the time i went to meet the minister for railways and then he wasn't he, like he he threw me out of his office he thought i was crazy <laughs> yeah he asked me one question he said how how do you transport a a train from here to Manchester. And I was like, "If have you seen the images of like the late 20th century? Even at the time, trains were being brought here, you know? So I think it was a question of, there was a lack of will, but mm. secondly also, one of the biggest problems we have is a lack of imagination. Because in my mind, I had seen the train in Manchester in the gallery, right. you know? Uh, but in his mind, it was nonsensical and stupid. And um, so that couldn't happen. But I got access, Koegri at the time gave me access to some of the trains, at the time, they, had started, they were cutting the trains into pieces. So it wasn't something that, it was something that I wanted to buy and preserve and also transform it because I was interested in the memory of these objects, these, the, the trains and what they are because late uh, 19th century, the train, the railway network had been built, but a lot of the labor that was used in building it actually came from the north, uh-huh. even the working in the mines and others. So I was really looking at retracing these memories because a lot of the rail tracks only ended in the Ashanti region, specifically Kumasi area. It never went to the north. Mm. So I was looking at ways in which we could take the trains together with the lines, things that had been used to extract commodities, gold, bauxite, or whatever, and now take the memory to the place where, like, children, imagine children, like, seeing these objects for the first time. I somehow believe that the labor, the memory was encapsulated within these objects. It was impossible, so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until, I think, uh, a year and a half when we started i met christabel and we are both part of uh, alewa uh, with zenato uh, cohorts uh, west africa leadership program and uh, at the time i i met um uh, Chris, Chris, Chris Chiado, Chiado, yeah. who yeah, he had he was the one that nominated me for the program and we're talking and i told him about uh, this some of the ideas i was working with so imagine it was almost almost uh, nine years after i started this as expedition again about who you know it was See? through him after nine years. He made a phone call. We went to meet the minister because the minister had been changed. We went to meet the next minister. And then that's when, that's when the first ones happened. But even that one, yeah. it was supposed to be something that was supposed to be given to us for free, but there was money taken. It was so very messy. But at the end of the day, I was happy that at least I was able to get these objects. Because for me, it's more or less about the action. What happens? beyond underneath and all the mechanisms i tried to ignore it right. so we got the trains up north for the first time and then ever since i started looking at ways in which we could even expand that because if you look at um uh, the science museum and also in ghana there is no way you can go and say that oh you're going to learn about these things both from an archival point of view and also from an object point of view so and also the interesting thing is that the south does these objects at the service because it's so close to the sea and if you're not willing to build institutions that can protect them right. against the breeze right. of the sea, then you might as well not do it. The only place where they can survive in the open is in the north because of the weather and the climate. So for me, I thought that it was somehow interesting to somehow like uh, uh, move them across the south. So that's where the, the inspiration came from. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for telling us that. Um, if you're just joining us, this is the Haspra Diaspora Roundtable. Uh, if you don't know what a Haspra is, it's AHA here from the diaspora. So it's Guineans and Africans who have returned home and want to make a difference. It's very simple. So we're making a difference in this room by having a conversation with the Ibrahim Mahama, the artist. I like to add it that way so that everybody knows who we're talking to. And he's telling us his journey. We've gone back and forth. We started from primary. We headed to uni. Then we went to the UK for a little bit talked about his artwork that is there right now if you haven't seen it look it up it's in the guardian it's on bbc it's everywhere um and then brought back his journey about the trains the trains i thought was very interesting and he's teaching us art science history politics 
I mean, it, it's every, it, <laughs> destiny, passion, discovery, research. So again, he may be an artist as an, a visionary and sees things that I don't see, but he's a whole lot more in so many industries than one. So you are truly a black star, you know. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So for those of you joining us online, thank you so much for joining from around the world. We'll continue the journey. You have an installation called Red Clay, which I am very ashamed to, see, I, to say I still haven't seen it, although I literally used to practically live in the North because of the work I did, and I will go see it. And if you haven't seen it in this room, please make it a point. It is amazing, and I'm talking about from seeing it on, online, so I can only imagine what it looks like. Can you tell us about Red Clay? What made you start Red Clay? Who is your audience? Because that's a particular place I'm passionate about. Go for it. Uh, Red Clay is uh, is an artist studio. So I, it's registered as a studio. Um, there are a couple of institutions that uh, started working on in the north. Uh, Red Clay is one of them. It started off with SCC. That's the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. I started building this uh, when I've earned my first money when I sold the first work to the Saatchi Gallery, that was the money that I used as a seed money to start building this space. Mm. The idea was to have a studio. I remember one of my professors telling me, I said, uh, I want to build a studio. And he said, why not build it in the North? I didn't grow up in the North, mm -hmm. but he thought that by building a studio in the North, it could somehow go a long way to inspire younger people who would want to become artists one day. Yes. Because it's not so much about what you produce in your studio, but it's about the influence of the studio and the people around it. So I started building SCCA, but later on, I decided to make it into a contemporary art institution because I realized there were a lot of older artists who had done significant work, but their works were not connected to younger generations. So Kofi Dawson, who we did our first retro retrospective on in 2019, and later on to Ajima Nosei, and then a couple of other people and group exhibitions. And currently we are doing uh, organizing an exhibition on James Bano, the 95-year-old mm -hmm. Ghanaian photographer, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. opens uh, 2nd June okay. in Tamale. Um, that, that, so that's what the form that the first studio took. The idea that an artist studio could become an enabling ground for many other things to happen. Mm. And then Red Clay sub came afterwards. At the time, I thought, since I'm deciding to use this studio as an institution, why not build another space? And then maybe this space could actually be the place where I could work. But when I started working, building Red Clay, I realized quickly, because at the time I was also staying in Germany, doing a residency and also traveling around teaching, and I realized that around the world, there were so many institutions that were doing very interesting things. And in Tamale, this place that I had bought, it was literally like out of town at the time. And I was the first person building in that area. There was no water, there was no electricity. And most of my neighbors hadn't started building. So I started talking to them about buying up their lands to expand what the studio could be. But then the idea also was not so much about building a studio where the artist could be in solitude to work. But the idea was to build a studio that could allow me to share the work that I was doing mm. with people. Because I realized that a lot of the kids in the community were coming there to play and others. And I realized here too, kids go to construction sites which yeah. are, or building sites Absolutely. which are abandoned to play and things like that. Mm -hmm. And in my studio, when you come there, there are archives because I travel around, I collect a lot of archives. I, a lot of the work that I produce, which are in collections around the world, I always make sure that there are artist proofs, there are master copies of the work here because that's one of the things that in Africa for a long time we didn't have because capital accumulates in the West. When a lot of artists produce this work, the work ends up in Western collections. Right. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to build an institution that could somehow keep the legacy of my work. Because people always think that, oh, you have to, when, you are, when I'm old one day, I'll do this and that. No, I think when you're young, that's when it matters. Absolutely. Because when we are young, it's the time when we can influence other young people. Because when young people see old people succeed, it's almost as if you have to spend a long time. But whilst you're young, you can also be influential. And I could see that among the kids in how they will lead themselves and all that. So it, 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 it started off just from that point. So once we started welcoming people to the studio, I then now thought, okay, why not expand it? Why not introduce this? Why not add the Parliament of Ghosts? Why not uh, add uh, cinema spaces? Why not have a library? Why not have a, a greenhouse? Why not... Uh, expand it into an art school why not do this so the question has always been about the why what constitutes an artist studio is it just a place that produces objects or commodities or is it a place where everything that i'm talking about now can become a gift to uh, the community that it finds itself in and even just 
when I talk about the community, I don't mean like specifically Tamale, mm. but it's all of us who are sitting here Absolutely. because in uh, 100 years or 50 years to come or 100 years to come, when they are looking at uh, your body of work in terms of what it means, they are not now going to go to uh, MoMA or like in Tate to be able to find your archive. That archive would be part of the soil. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what constituted the idea of the studio, the place which is... Yeah, we are all trying to learn together, understand. So when you come to my studio, there are archives, there are things in boxes like textiles. Mm -hmm. So I go out of my way to buy things like textiles. I collect a lot of furniture, old, even buildings that are broken down in Tamale and other places. I go around and I buy buildings that like tropical buildings that have been destroyed. I buy all the component doors, windows, and then I pack it and I take it to the studio and I keep it in storage. Um, I collect all kinds of things, airplanes, um, anything. Uh, I think in the next two weeks, we are transporting a plane even to Tamale, oh, wow. to the studio. And it was one of the old Ghana Airways planes, the DC-9. Mm -hmm. And the idea, we've taken, we're have taken, we taking out the seats. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, the ones in Tamale already, there are classrooms and other things. But this one is special because this plane went to different places. It went to China, wow. Brazil, mm -hmm. like it really traveled. And the, the, the idea was to take out the seats from it and then build a vitrine inside. Oh. You know, Bano... Uh, James Bano did a lot of really interesting photographs mm -hmm. of Nkrumah and mm -hmm. others. And the idea is to put these photographs in the vitrine at the nice. height of a child. So we've even put air conditions in it and we've bought a whole generator just for the transport of the plane. So the plane is going to move from here all the way to the border of Burkina Faso on land. And then as it's moving, it will stop by communities and kids will see Amazing. these exhibitions. So that's wow. what the studio is about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, inclusion, the height of a child. Did you guys hear that? He's not going to make it high so that the child can't see it, which is sadly typically what our culture looks like, right? Everything is high. When you're older, you're wiser. You, you're, you are way ahead of your age, according to our culture. No. <laughs> but wow. No, but it's also because, like, if you study art history, you get mm. to understand, even during the, when the, the, when the white cube was invented, even during, like, during the salon, like, even European art, when, uh, works, when artists made works and they were installing the works, they always installed the work according to which one was most important, the genre of paintings. So they had the most interesting paintings on the eye level. That's where they believe that when you stand at the height of an adult, right. you could see these paintings very well. And then the paintings that they didn't think were so well, they put it at the top. You have to stretch your uh -huh, <laughs> things like that. But then it's all about inclusion because for me, that's why I talked about the idea that art is not about what we know. It's about what is to become. Mm. So the idea is that when the, we have always believed that if one of the problems that we have in the world is the gap of imagination, so if you design any system that somehow already starts with even children to begin with, mm -hmm. the primary audience, because mm -hmm. at, in Tamale at the studio, that's what we do. So we run programs that we pay for buses that go to communities, and then we bring these kids to the studio, and then we give them tours. But we also give, there are kids in the community that we also work with, that when other kids come, they also give them tours. But the most important thing was about the question of language. Mm. Because then now when the kids come, when I, though like I'm black like them and everything, I'm Dagomba, sometimes they see me as an outsider. They think some of them say, ah, they, yeah, he lives abroad, they're like he's, yeah. But then when there are other kids like them who speak the same language, even like our caretaker assemblyman who is speaking the local language, when he's translating, let's say, a complex thought in terms of the things I'm talking about, philosophy and everything, and then he's talking about it in the local Dagbani language, to even the local population who are coming. It's believable. Right. Because then now, they're like, ah, yes. If you're talking about, let's say, uh, if you're talking about Max, and then you're talking about it, let's say, in a local language, then now it becomes inclusive. But then sometimes the mistake that we make is that some people think that, oh, we have to make it complex. But then the world, we know that the world is a complex place, but also it can be very simple. And when we make it simple, it allows for all kinds of people to be included. And when that inclusion happens, that's when it actually makes a lot of magic or things happen. Because then now you are redistributing ideas, knowledge, and all these forms. And you never really know who, which child it will inspire. Mm. It will transform the way they see the world and how they will come back 
doctorate, even if they are doctors, engineers, Absolutely. lawyers, or whatever, because I'm not aiming to produce more artists, but I'm aiming to produce more people that think, at least would have a critical thought. If we had more doctors and lawyers who are more critical thinking, I think that professional-wise, it would be much more better within our world, ethically, morally, and all that. Uh -huh. But sometimes we say, oh, we just we need more artists. Sometimes we say that, no, maybe we don't need more artists. What we need is more people with artistic sensibilities, whether they're wow. doctors or whatever. Yeah. We do not need more artists. We need more people with artistic sensibilities. That is a quote, right? It's down <laughs> somewhere. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, I have two more areas I want to go to, and then I'll open it up to our most esteemed guests who are here to ask you random questions. At that time, it will get very difficult. Um, but let me start with a topic I love, yeah. governance, right? What is the role of government in let me put it two ways. I'll get slightly controversial. <laughs> what is the role of government, and when I say government, I'm talking our country, because we're both Guineans, in this journey that you've had? Has it been a positive one? Has it been negative, a mixed bag? What are the feelings there, right? So that's one. And then take it to the next level after you've said whatever it is you say, and then tell me what you think the role of government should be in creating a more inclusive, creative art space. So do the personal story and then take it more to the bigger sector. Um, it's a difficult one, actually. Um, although it's very simple. It's sometimes, it's, yeah, sometimes you just can't, you just don't understand. Like um, currently, I remember uh, when I came back, I, I, there, was, uh, a, there were some boxes of charcoal I had brought in because I recently started making these series of drawings after, since secondary school, like even up to uni, I stopped. So more than 10 years, I wanted to go back to it. And you know, charcoal that artists use, it's very soft. It's bent under very specific temperatures. It's not like the charcoal we use for burning, uh, for making for as fuel. So when you make a stroke, the charcoal dissolves immediately. Like it goes very quickly. So I brought in about three boxes for my work. Immediately, I got to the airport. They this were like, was you have to pay. Yesterday. Yeah, you have yeah. to pay uh, uh, import tax on it. And I was like, okay. I, mean, I thought we were going to see some 1,000, 2,000 cities. That's 6,000. I was like, what? I said, like, how? Yeah, no. So we went back and forth, back and forth. In the end, I had to pay 21,000. Just arriving in the country, having charcoal, just to be creative to begin with. Yeah, so I was like, okay, fine. But I wasn't thinking so much about, I wasn't even. Like at the time, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't I, like, I was a bit agitated about it, but I was like, okay, fine. Like, you know, we already know this because sometimes when you produce even books and then you bring the books to distribute to libraries and schools and others, even for free, you have to pay taxes on it. And the taxes are far more than the things that we produce. Recently, I had to bring in a lot of the works that are done in institutions around the world, which I was bringing in. So because I created a trust, which I'm gifting all the work that I'm doing to this trust. Because uh, my wife and I are always talking about the fact that uh, one day, what are we going to will to our children? I said, we can only will uh, how we take care of them, education and all that. But in terms of, let's say, my life's work as an artist, it doesn't belong to my kids. It belongs to the entire country. So I, I'm trying to bring in all these works so at least we can put them in a trust. And they came in containers <laughs> because they're very huge works. And then when they came... Back and forth, like the taxes that I received, it was like 400 and something thousand. And it was so ridiculous at the port. And I was like, I could have just left these things at the places that they were. But in the end, of course, because I also believe in what I'm doing so much, I found the money and I paid for it and then we got it. So it's in Ghana now. So at least I know that it's here for a lifetime. So these, these are difficult, honestly, when you have to work. So when you are building an institution, I think sometimes the thing that we don't realize is that there are young people who actually want to dedicate their lives to building, to be, to be part of the building block. I remember when I was in uh, Malta recently, I was doing an exhibition and I was taking a ferry and I met one guy. He was from Kumasi. He came to sit next to me on the ferry. I think he just wanted to, like, he wanted to sit next to someone that he felt close. He was black. I was only black on the ferry, you know. <laughs> so, immediately, when I saw, I was looking at his fingers. I mean, I like looking at people. So, I was looking at his fingers. And I realized that they were soiled with paint. So, I realized that he was probably working in a construction or something. 
So I turned to him and I said that, oh, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Ghana. I said, oh, I'm also from Ghana. And I said, which part from Ghana? He said, he's from uh, Kumasi. And I said, oh, yes, I schooled in Kumasi. I did my undergrad, blah, blah, blah. But he hadn't gone to school so much, you know. And uh, he went to Malta through the Mediterranean. He went through Niger and all that, the whole journey. And he had been there for 10 years, you know. Uh. So we're having a whole conversation. And imagine the both of us, the same age. He was exactly the same age as I am. And then I, he couldn't even believe that I was all the travels because we were on the boat for like almost an hour. So we had a lot to talk about. And he didn't believe that I was traveling around the world and doing all the work that I'm doing with my Ghanaian passport. And I said, yes. And I, he said, oh, but I'm sure you have a European passport. And I said, no, I have a Ghanaian passport. He couldn't be, so I had to take out my passport and show it to him with all the stamps at the back and forth, the visas and everything. And it, it was at that point that I realized Although, like, sometimes we, 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 we complain, but I realized that there was an inherent sense of privilege that I had mm. that I took for granted for quite a while. Yeah. So then when we parted ways, I took his number and then I went to sit in a taxi to continue the journey. And I was also talking with the taxi driver. And he turned to me at some point and he said, my God, you speak very good English. And I was, I was almost going to be offended. But then I remembered, because this guy that I was just with, he could barely speak English mm. and even like he needed people to read his documents. For, so he was telling me about how he regretted so much not going to school, things like that. On one hand, I could have been tempted to think that, oh yeah, he, why didn't he stay in Ghana? Why didn't he do this? Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. But then again, when I look at myself, even me with, let's say, Red Clay and all the institutions that are built all these years, it's impossible to get access even in Tamale, like where we are, when I got there, there was no electricity. I had to buy the electric poles and pay for the electricity to come. The people that were living in the village, they had been voting for so many years. There was no electricity in the village. Secondly, up to date, we don't have drinking water. It's been almost 10 years now. So I'm asking myself, so if I can go into a place and invest so much money into building an institution, and yet the most common thing like water, you cannot get, then at the end of the day, you question yourself, is this right or wrong? But I think the thing that overrides our conscience is that, as I spoke about, is the question, is the thing of the gift. Because we understand that we inherently have certain privileges. I could decide any point in time to travel and not come back. Every time you sit on a plane and go, you can make that decision not to come back. But we always return. The reason why we return is that there are people who don't have those choices, who cannot make those choices. And when they do it, they have to do it through very precarious means. Like the boy the guy that I met in Malta, he could have died in the Mediterranean, like many of the people that do that. But at the end of the day, it's also not their fault. It's because the systems that are supposed to be in place that allow us to know, to know the worth of ourselves and realize that we can actually make a contribution to the state or the country that we call our own, it doesn't actually work. And it's mostly dependent on whether you know someone. But that's so precarious. It doesn't work, you know, to a very large extent. Though, like, it will get you some things, but then at the end of the day, you ask yourself, the people that it will get them those things, they are less than 1% 1 of 1% 1 of 1% 1 of the population. So, though I'm an artist, and then I realize that things are still precarious, I still understand that there are certain privileges that I have that ordinarily most people don't have those privileges. So, again, I'm asking myself, how do I go beyond all these difficulties, Absolutely. beyond the state? Because I also started thinking of it more as a gift. Because without those interferences and all that. I'll tell you a story. In Tamale, we have problems with the EPA. When I took the trains there, there were issues. Ghana Water Company. Yes, aid. Ghana Water Company. Uh, I'm currently in court with them because they say I'm owing them water, which they didn't give us. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I even paid for the connection of the pipeline years ago. In COVID, there was no water anywhere. The vice president's house is not far, far away from this place. The road in Tamale has been done all the way to the house and then everything else is rubble. So there, you see these things all the time. Yeah, and then you ask yourself, what, is it worth it? Like, because I, sometimes it almost seems as if um, if you even want to make a contribution in a country, the contribution is not needed. Mm. You see that if you don't want to be here, really, you, it, you can go. Uh -huh. So I think those are some of the conversations that we also need to have on a more political level. And also beyond, like on a policy level, like how yeah. do we create systems that allow young people to actually understand that every decision that they make actually to contribute their sweat and blood actually into this country means something, not just for themselves, right. but actually for the country that we live in. Brahim, what I like about you is you took us through a sorrowful journey. 
Mm. And then you ended it on a positive note, which is that it's bigger than us, right? Of course. Um, I brought about the governance discussion because we have to have the discussion. We have to have the real stories. We need to invest in the arts, right? As a country, as as a government. And I'm not saying it's not being done. I'm looking at Nana Fredia or Foriata. Hi. Um, I had to do that, sorry. But I know in the room we have the Ghana Creative Arts Association. We have we were intentional in our invitations and we wanted to bring together um, a different array of people to have these conversations. So I say this to say that stay for reception and talk to people. Talk to people you don't know. The private sector is here. I see MTN. I see uh, amazing lawyers and there. I won't mention names, but they're in and out. And they we we are the solution right here in this room. And I think. We work a lot in silos, and if we do that, we will not be able to be. But if not us, who? If not now, when? And so thank you. Thank you for connecting electricity. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, that I, I'm, I'm torn. You know, I studied international development, so I'm very torn when it comes to these topics, right? There's a role for government. Government is supposed to give us the public goods. That's what it is. And it's not working very well. It needs to work. It hasn't been working very well for a long time. So this is not about a particular... Uh, a time frame, right? But there's also a role for those of us here, educated, privileged, to have these conversations, to also do more, mm -hmm. you know, to open the red clays, to form the ahaspras, to tell the stories, right? Um, so if you're sitting in your corner and you're asking yourself, what have you done lately? Keep asking because <laughs> you really need to answer that question. So thank you. Thank you for taking us on that journey. Um, let me end by asking you a question about who, and maybe there are many people, but pick one person. Who is your inspiration? Yeah. Um, may I always be biased. <laughs> I mentioned my mentor at the, at the university, Karikacha. Mm. Yeah. You know, my, uh, my professional career all started in Kumasi. And um, yeah, I'm always very, I always say that it's the best decision I made in my life to go to the university in Kumasi to study painting. And uh, when I met uh, Karikacha, I became like good friends with him. You know, when you're a student, there are, yeah, there are some students that they make wrong, they, they, there are wrong reasons why they make friends with some of their professors. But I always liked the idea of just having conversations with him because uh, he's such a brilliant man. And also uh, to be able to find people that actually are brilliant, but at the same time, they have a lot of empathy. And also they're always trying to find ways in which they can push their students to do things that they didn't do, but to do it in a very material, tangible sense. Uh -huh. So each time I'm away and there is, I have a question or like I'm not sure about something, I'll call my, um, hello, yeah. Light off to the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I call, I still like, I still call my professors and my colleagues and I, I, I say, look, I encountered this thing. Um, what do I do? What decision do I make? You know, there's always this case where you are in, um, professionally, you could be like higher than people, but you always think that, oh, what would they know about the situation? But then you'd be surprised what people know. Yeah, so for me, my greatest inspiration has actually been my teachers at the, at the, in Kumasi. Okay. But uh, secondly, also has been about just ordinary people. I think some of the most, the people who have inspired me the most have also been the workers at the, at the railway in mm. Ghana. Uh, throughout the history, if you look at it from the colonial days up until now, in terms of the, the amount of work, I spent 10 years going to that space, back, going back and forth. You know, so I learned a lot about just the idea of work, just work in itself as a, as a, as a thing, mm. you know. So each time you go to these spaces, you get very inspired, uh -huh. particularly when you see the state of decay within those areas. But at the end of the day, how even those people are still finding new ways to reinvent forms there and to keep the system alive. Uh -huh. So for me, I, I get inspired by very different things, but certainly those I learned from school and then also people that I see their work on a daily basis also inspire me. Amazing. This is somebody who sucked history, research, philosophy, 
I mean, international relations, and he's inspired by his teachers. Let's give a round of applause for teachers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll have a last question after we are all, all is said and done, but I want to open up to all, hey, we're small. <laughs> I would like to open up uh, for questions from the audience. We'll take a round of three. He will respond and then we'll come back. I see Mauli, I see Nicole, I see Adoma. So it's Mauli here, Adoma, Nicole. The first round, I see Kwamnedu. I, I knew you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but oh, Eugene, sorry, my eyes. I apologize. <laughs> and then you, I, I okay, three first. Okay. Mauli, Adoma, Nicole, we start. All right, good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is Mauli Dake. Um, I wear different hats, but my favorite uh, identity right now is citizen activist. You. And uh, before my question, I want to commend you both. I actually see that you two have a lot in common. Um, sometimes we talk about the, the challenges that we have as a people and it becomes overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, but as you were sharing, I also see a, a bit of you in Christabel because uh, I've had several conversations with Chris Tabel where we'll be talking about a problem and she'll be like, let's do this. And before you realize, mm -hmm. uh, she's actually pursuing uh, those actions. So I, I see that similarity and I want to commend you. Okay. And now to my question, you, um, in recent times, have been doing some work around citizenship, uh, both as a Ghanaian, but also a Pan-Africanist. And the most difficult parts uh, that is extremely difficult for me to engage our people on uh, is the aspect of imagination. Uh, because I try to make the point that part of our role as citizens is, is not just to defend and protect what we have. Uh, there's also an important element about reimagining who we can be. Uh, so when we talk, whether it's in terms of identity, as who we have been told we are, or even in the question that Christabel asked you about governance. It is possible to reimagine a new Ghana, a new governance system that actually works for everybody, not just for the 1% or mm -hmm. those who know someone. Um, so from where you sit, I can see uh, you said that a lot of people think you are crazy. A lot of the things you were saying, I was like, this guy is he okay. Uh, <laughs> but that is where it starts, right? And it takes a bit of that to be able to pursue the things that we actually need to do to, to make that change. And so from where you sit, what role do you see your industry playing in helping us open our mind to those new possibilities and imagining a new Ghana, a new Africa that works for all? Thank you very much, Mali. We'll go to Adoma. Mali talks a you lot. Say so. Mali, Nicole, and then Adoma. <laughs> 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 I was just going along this. You know I love you. It's okay. All right, Adama, please. Good, good evening. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Christabel, for the invitation. It's been such a lovely conversation. So my question to you, Ibrahim, is that I sense a lot of urgency in mm -hmm. terms of your work and the things that you're doing. And I'm just curious having this urgency to create and do so much. Great, thank you. See, private sector, straight to the point. <laughs> 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 Nicole, please. <laughs> Thank you for this, this has been wonderful. A very specific question, my, uh, my niece, she's Ghanaian American, uh, she's a university student in Virginia, and she wants to go into curation and installation. What are some actionals, actionable steps she should take right after university or in university, while she's in university, to get to where you are? Mm. Ibrahim, over to you. <laughs> the first one is a long question about yeah. activism. Second one. <laughs> I, I don't even remember the first question. Yeah, <laughs> it was very long. Yeah, but identity activism. No, he was asking yeah. about our role, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. yeah, but I think yeah, I was I think I was I, I was hinting on that before. I think it's also about the investment into these kinds of institutions. Like the field itself already is precarious. A lot of the look. A lot of uh, when I was in uni. I would say that I wasn't the brightest student in my class even. There were really interesting guys in my class, like in terms of like thoughts, even art. Some of them, like one of them is Salam Koji, who is the artistic director for the institution in Tamale. And there's also one guy, Patrick Newcanter, and a couple of others. 
there were people, there are so many bright people who pursue different things, career courses in this country, but they end up abandoning it because there isn't that infrastructure that keeps them going. Yeah, so for us, the idea was to build these infrastructures that could help to sustain the interest from these people. And then by even just from my side, doing what I'm doing, it's gone on to inspire many other people. In, in a crowd these days, you realize that there are a lot of artists who are beginning to build studios and all kinds of other things. And there are people who are coming to Ghana who ordinarily, they would never have come here. And now when you're talking about art in the world, in terms of like looking at art, contemporary art, Ghana is one of the significant points of it. Yeah. So um, infrastructure is one of the most important things. And I don't like it when individuals or pri the private sector only has to be able to do this. The state has to be able to invest into this. I think the reason why it's important on a state level is because when we do it at the state level, then we know that it is actually meant for all of us. It's a collective thing. Mm. That's why the state exists. Uh -huh. So I think uh, both from our side, we do what we can, and then the state also has to be able to invest in the infrastructure that sustains the interest from our side so that it can open up the field. And then the second question was about uh, urgency. urgency. Yeah. Honestly, look, I wish, like, I, when I was born, my father named me uh, Old Man. That's after his father. I was the only one he, he, he gave that name in the family. And he somehow believed that I was his father reborn. Uh, my grandfather, who he named me after, in the 1920s, he walked from Tamale all the way to Accra. He worked as a chef in the, during the colonial era and, uh, in Accra. And at the time, a lot of people used to make those huge migration points because they used to work in the mines, in the railway, blah, blah, things like that. And, you know, climate change was already taking place. So people would move to Ejura and all these other places. So when you go down, there are family members who live in those places. I always say that I wished I was born in a different time. I know you can't cheat time. That the reason why we are who we are is because we are born within a very specific time and the order of things makes us who we are. But sometimes I wish I had been born, let's say, uh, even half a century ago. Because as it seems, there is quite a lot of uh, things that have happened in our country's history, particularly when it comes to like even material forms, like things that have been destroyed in terms of architecture, um, um, uh, um, relics, um, machines, and all kinds of other things. And I always say that I wish I was born early enough in order to, in to intervene within these things. So when I do my work, I almost imagine that I was living 50 years ago doing it. It's so urgent. If we don't do it now, that's it. It's gone. Okay. Like the trains, for instance, when I started buying them. Like Ghana had more than, God, God knows, like had more than 500 trains. Today, when you check into our inventory, there are less than probably 40 of them. Wow. Everything is gone. Exactly. So it's so urgent. It's so urgent. Some that mm. we think that, oh, yeah, but, you know, we can do it another time. No, there's no other time. I do it like I was living. It was yesterday. Uh -huh. Though I'm also doing it because there is, I'm trying to keep the past as a future. But at the same time, you also have to treat because it's something very practical mm. that you're engaging in. And money becomes an issue. Like sometimes, like in the last two weeks alone, I spent almost two million cities acqu acquiring some of these objects. I'm not supposed to do that work. I could care less about it. But at the end of the day, the question is that will I be able to go to sleep knowing that out of 31 million people, you had this burden and you could actually do something about it and you did not do it. You didn't do it. So that's where the urgency comes from. Yeah. So it's, it's heavy in that sense. Yeah. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, but should I really do it? Mm. And I remember I was where my wife and I were in London and I was, I was so angry about the whole thing. But I realized that I have to do it. I can complain as much as I want, but I have to make that step. After we make that step, then we can come back and make the decision. But if I don't make that step and then everything disappears, then I can't come back and then what would I, what would I say? Oh, I had mm. the chance. I could have, but I wasn't compelled enough. I think it's within that thing, the, the thing that compels us, the, where we find the courage and all that, that is the thing that we have to look for. And we have to apply it to so many things within our society for it to at least prosper to a, an extent. There was a last question. The you're practical about your, question your, about what your, to study. You know? Yeah, you yeah. I think it's yeah, people have to travel and then yeah. They, they have to travel and experience things. Mm. Uh when you are in the, when you are in America studying, because I know that in America studying can be quite expensive. Um when you are in Ghana, of course now even it's a bit it's quite expensive as compared to when I was a student 
the education system was still subsidized. And I was, I think our year 2011 was the last year that the government subsidized education. After that, uh, you had to pay so much money to go to the university. Um, and I had to fund so many scholarship schemes for that to happen at the university. But then also to, uh, there are students who would, because in Europe there are so many institutions, there are things that you don't have to study or learn. You know, but when you come to Africa or to places where the curators have to invent the system as they go along, it's a very different conversation. Uh -huh. So like in Tamale, we have to build the infrastructure. Uh, we have to uh, build an institution. We have to provide the work. We have to be curators. Uh, we have to become drivers. Sometimes we have to take a truck and drive it to a village and bring school kids. We have to take a generator and show them film. It's a very different work to when you're studying to be a curator for instance, in the West, whereas the institutions exist, you go, you get a job, there's a, there's a nice salary with a pension, blah, blah, blah. Whereas here, it doesn't exist. You have to invent that entire system. So when someone is studying elsewhere, I think it's important for them to somehow uh, travel across different spaces mm -hmm. in the world in order to be able to learn how things actually work in places. Yeah, and then maybe through that, it could also give them a different sense of attitude regarding the, the practice that they, they, they think that they want to take. Excellent. Travel yeah. and see. Yeah. So Eugene, Brian, <laughs> Ivy. Yes. Sorry, I didn't want to forget. We'll do another round. Don't worry. Um, so where's the microphone? Oh, it's all the way on. Yeah. So all the way to the end. And then we'll work our way back. Cynthia, I see you. Don't worry. Just, yeah, thank you. All right, so I'm going to cheat and ask two questions. The first one is a bit on the light side. Whatever happened to the person you swapped with to get into the arts class? <laughs> and more seriously, because um, this question came to me this weekend. Do you think the thing you are most proud of is behind you or is still yet to come? That's an excellent question. So I'll take the second one too. You know what, Cynthia, and then we'll come down to Brian, right there. Thank you. Hi, Ibrahim. I've been to the Red Clay Studio. I think it's marvelous. It was quite um, exciting to see the quality of art um, in a place, if I may say, as random as the middle of um, well, even on the outskirts of Tamale, mm -hmm. um, I did enjoy my experience. I came with a city um, caravan. Mm -hmm. It was partly work, but mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed that night. So thank you for that experience. I also want to say that the first time I heard of you, I remember it was something about you spending all the $1 million to bring some old planes to, <laughs> to the north. And I was like, what? He didn't even save anything. <laughs> So, I mean, hearing you speak, I, I can understand um, why you did that. And I think that we need more people like you who are selfless. Um, but my question is this. What would you do to refine the curriculum? Um, mm. And considering the fact that, you know, you're focusing on young people, you know, having grown up in Ghana, schooled in Ghana for majority of my mm. life, um, we all know how the Ghanaian system is. Um, as a creative, I sort of stumbled into it, but technically I should have been a lawyer or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had to refine the curriculum, what would you do to ensure that we don't lose out on future creatives and that future creatives don't become engineers and doctors? No shade to engineers and doctors. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I think that it will be nice to see someone like you even though the systems and perhaps the government may not be as forthcoming, but it would be fantastic to see someone like you input or at least provide some kind of a proposal on how we could amend things. That's it. I know that there's a lot of curriculum changes that go on in Ghana. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll come down to Brian. Right. Just you can hop them on. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, good evening, everyone. And um, Ibrahim, thanks for granting us this audience. My question is, do you offer internship positions, right? If you do, this will be an opportunity to help groom next generation of, you know, Ibrahim's and include Nicole's nephew and or niece in, <laughs> into the internship program. That would fast track them 
and and, and allow you to accelerate whatever you want to achieve yeah. you know in this yeah. within this time frame thank you ivy you get the last word in this round please pass it down thank you i got it thank you for spending the time with us today uh, my name is ivy prosper i have visited your the red clay and i thought it was phenomenal i love the way that it's made for youth because i mean i'm quite tall and getting inside the plane with the way the tables were set up was absolutely perfect uh, the question i have for you is um, considering that your focus is on young people what advice would you give to a young Ghanaian who may be living in a rural community and may be dreaming of becoming an artist? What are the actionable steps you would tell that young person to take in order to pursue that dream? Because young people who are in Accra have more access to someone who's in some of these smaller communities. So what advice would you give? Okay. We'll start with the last one. Yes. Advice to a young person uh, to pursue the dream. And then fits the next. Internships. Do you do internships? So we have more Ibrahim Mahamas. Okay. Um, and then if you had access to the curriculum, what would you refine to ensure that we don't lose out on creatives? Let's do those because those are academic. And then we'll ask you the last thing. Okay. Yeah, we do internships, certainly. We've uh, taken interns from all different fields, even national service, um, from even KNUST, UDS, like different places. Um, uh, we've even had students from Europe uh, come do internships with us. Uh, those, some of them were curators. Uh, there was one recently who was writing her thesis actually on my work. So she came to stay with us in Tamale for two weeks. Recently, when I went to Italy to work on the Venice Biennial, actually, she was even there helping us with the install, but she was writing her thesis in Italy. Um, yeah, so we're actually open. It's a public institution, though it is uh, privately uh, owned and funded. Um, yeah, and then... Curriculum. Curriculum. Yeah, the curriculum, I will come to her question about the advice to young artists in the rural area. It depends on where they are and mm. access mm. to begin with yeah access is very important you know and that's why i thought that if you're creating if if we can build our institution is still young and it's one that we're still trying to understand what it is in the role of it in the society that we find ourselves in so maybe every once in a while you might find that we're working with people where we're mentoring them we're creating scholarship schemes that can allow them to study in the university like i've done that for 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 quite a long time but the idea is that how do we create how do we find these people also because a lot of them there are a lot of people who are creative who don't even get access to those kinds of environments schools and other places that you can identify them so working with even like um for instance the local talent like people who are involved in like basketry pottery and all kinds of other things it's one of the things that we are still trying to figure out you know to create a program that can actually even transcend beyond the formal system that we find ourselves in because even when it comes to um, talking about, let's say, artists or creatives, we're always looking at people who had some kind of formal training and things like that. But the question too is that, can we work with people from the informal sector, even like the pot makers, the weavers and all that. So that's why in my work, I always try as much as possible to work with people that work directly with their hands, because it's through that that you can actually understand the system, the, the system that we find ourselves in. So it's something that we are still figuring out, uh, to be honest with you. Um, um, but certainly as our institution is there, people come to us. Sometimes kids come there and then they want to come and make drawings. Uh, people bring their children and they say, oh, my child has a, uh, he, he's been drawing. He's very promising. Maybe you can. So we had these drawing classes where kids would come every weekend or every other days. Their parents would bring them in. And there was a woman who was very committed every, uh, twice a week, she would ride a motorbike 15 kilometers and bring her children wow. and then she would wait for them and then she would take them back home. Mother. Yeah. So every, she did that consistently for a long time, for about okay. two years, you know. So um, there are, once programs like this are done and it's, it's accessible, at least people want to be able to like uh, get access to them. And then the curriculum, I think from our part, we are trying as much as possible to expand what we do so that it can become more formal. Because I always thought that it would be quite interesting. The village where the institution is in, there is no art uh, 
like there is no school to begin with. So the kids have to walk several kilometers. I was always skeptical about the idea of like uh, building like a primary school, some then, mm. but at some point I realized that it was necessary because then if you have something uh, like a program there, then you can actually begin to influence the kids more permanently because when they go to schools and they come back, because sometimes they come there and they are so timid, they don't want to ask questions mm. because they think that if they ask the wrong questions, you beat them. Because uh, sometimes when their teachers come with them, you realize it's in Ghana, they come with a cane. So they don't even want to ask questions. But then I always tell them that this is the place you are meant to ask the wrong questions. Right. This entire thing that is here is not the right question. You know, it doesn't make sense for a young person of my age coming from a place like that to come back and then invest all this money. It's absurd to begin with. So let's take that absurdity as a starting point and then let's begin to ask ourselves questions. So when you start from that point of view with the kids, Sometimes they get excited. And also I was talking about the language thing and all that. So I think there is a mixture of different things that we have to implement, particularly when it comes to curriculum and all that. And also creativity, like um, there are a lot of artists in the world these days who didn't begin, begin as artists. They began as scientists, mm -hmm. as doctors, as mathematicians and all that. But then through that, they could bring a very fresh perspective to art. You know, like people would say, that, oh, but there's no relationship between mathematics and art and other things. No, but there is all that to do with it. You know, engineering and all that. When we brought the airplanes to Tamale and then uh, people thought that we were crazy. But then there were engineers, uh, there were people in doing robotics and all that. They are the ones who are coming there who are doing workshops in the airplane with the kids, school kids and all that. I only had to provide a vision for it. And I think that when we propose a curriculum that is open, that is not rigid, at least we know that different types of disciplines can work together. Even in secondary schools, why is it that maybe the visual arts class, they only have to have general knowledge, blah, 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 like their core, their, their, their elective subjects. If they could borrow, decide to borrow a course even from science or from business or whatever, those things, and mix those things up and know that even when you're looking at it, you have to look at it from a creative point of view. One of the, we had a, a, a I think in the university, we had a business uh, program but then it wasn't also executed well. They were all they were teaching the artists how to make money from their work in terms of the painting. But it's wrong. You, art doesn't work in that way. Just because you made a painting, you can use the logic of business. It doesn't. It's not. It doesn't. It's not very linear in that sense. There are so many things that makes a work of art valuable in that sense, or the business around it. So I think that also, even when it comes to business. Even in the business school, they need that creativity in order to understand that the logics of capitalism and the world that we live in doesn't apply to everything. Yeah. And I think the first question was... Was uh, what you're most proud of, is it behind you or ahead of you? I think it's both. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. There are things that I'm certainly proud of that I've done that I'm always like, mm, I can't believe I, I did this. And there are things that I think I'm yet to do that I'm craving, I'm waiting for. It might not happen now. It might happen in the next 20 years or 30 years, but I'm looking forward to it. And the more I look forward to it, the more it keeps me energy. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. So we're doing a last, what, sorry? <laughs> Which guy? What happened? <laughs> I, <laughs> ah! <laughs> Sorry, I, I was so confused. I don't know. Eh? I don't know. Did he, he did science, no? What did no. you do? He switched to us. Yeah, it arts. was arts. Okay, yeah, okay. we're doing like French. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you missed, at the very beginning, Ibrahim switched. He, he basically dedicated himself to switch to the class he wanted. And the question was, what happened to the guy? Um, we're oh. going to take... <laughs> We're going to take a last set of questions. My team tells me there are questions on Zoom. I, I will take two from Zoom and then we end it here in this room. We're going to go out and have a good networking session so you can keep talking to Ibrahim then as well. Um, but I want to be respectful of time. So Oba, tell us two questions from Zoom, so, the best ones. Okay. So Mohammed's question is, how can we as people, especially Africans or Ghanaians, for that matter, develop the technical eye to appreciate and understand the body of art. The last question is, what would he like to see happening at the Red Clay in 2035? See, that was my last question. Oh. So, <laughs> very good. We were Martin has beat you to the we'll, we'll leave that for the very last, absolutely. Um, 
in the room. Let's come to the room. You know, I have to have you. <laughs> this lady is trying to vie for Guinness Book of World Records for the longest painting. <laughs> Right? That's what it is. And you did how many hours? 168 hours of painting. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a black star. So, Sharon, please, you ask a question. Then, Nayo, just because, oh, okay, just because, right? He went to Presec. Let's do that. Uh -huh. And then, one last one. Oh, sorry. Kobina. I would have been in trouble today. Okay. okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's been my dream to meet you. So I'm happy I have finally. What I wanted to ask you was, whilst you were talking about the swapping, you said the moment you swapped with him, you became an artist. Mm. Meanwhile, from the past conversation, it looked like the art was already in you. <laughs> so I want to know why you said immediately you swapped with him was when you became an artist. She's yeah. an artist. She had something we all didn't hear. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Niall and then Kobena. Right. Thank you. All right, so Ibrahim, um, you said something. You said um, when young people do stuff to motivate people, it's even better than having you know older people and it really connected you know you're just about my age and you've done so much and i feel like i am so motivated by you right now um i was in london for the first time and just about a couple of weeks or months ago and i was talking to this white caucasian guy um and i'm like oh hello i'm frederick i'm Nayu. i'm Ghanaian. do you know ghana i don't know just asking if he knew about Ghana. I'm like, he's, he actually felt offended. He's like, of course I know Ghana. And, and this is, and oh, mind you, this meeting was in the Barbican. And he says, I even know there's a Ghanaian who is going to do something here at the Barbican. And I didn't know it was you. I had no idea of, uh, you know, the people like this because I didn't. If I had known, I would have said, oh, he's my wife's friend. <laughs> 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 yeah, I really would have, you know, made an impact there. But yeah, thank you very much for putting Ghana on the map like Absolutely. that. It's amazing to have somebody Absolutely. like you. Now, I have a question. So, you know that building at Labadi, that very tall building? Look, I, it's a void to me. The one so, that they haven't finished building yes, for. Okay. It feels like a void. Mm. Please. Cover it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay. Come near you, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, That's what we should do. All the buildings we don't like, cover it. That's all. Nice. Yeah. nice. yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, add to that gentleman's uh, point about how you're an inspiration to many of us as well. And um, not just your artistic talent, but then the breadth of your thinking and mm. what you're trying to do and the selflessness with which you did, uh, with which you're doing it. And I think many people think you're crazy for spending so much of your own money for public good and it's really disappointing to see some of the uh, frustrations you face and i hope that you can use your voice sometimes to raise some of the issues which we the little guys may not be able to do and um i was at red clay about three years ago and i have a question sort of related to brands in that yes you get in interns but um what can people most of them in this room with uh, mid-career upper management uh, skills um contribute to uh, to what Reckley is doing, um, being that this group, as I understand, is mostly of Ghanaians, many of them who have lived um, outside and uh, have some high-level skills. Thank you. We also have development partners here, who, so we, we're in the right room. Private sector is here as well. So answers. Um, you can start from the last, which is Kovna's question about how can we contribute. I really like that. Um, then there's a question about why did you say then you became an artist when you swapped? Okay, let's do this too first. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why did I say that? I didn't say that because I didn't feel that I wasn't an artist before, but it was more or less about, you know, it's a, it, then I was talking about it from a professional point of view. Yeah. 
because then you had at least teachers, people that could mentor you and things like that. You were part of a system now, you know, and that was important. That is important, actually, when you're trying to study or understand something. Yeah, you can try to be a scientist, but then you also need peers. You need people that you can share your ideas and thoughts with and things like that. And I remember those days when we were students uh, in high school, we used to have this thing where every night when I go to bed, I was uh, the, the boarding house was also full to begin with. So they, they couldn't give me a bed in the boarding house. So I was a day student and I used to, I was in a hostel. And every night <laughs> I, would, uh, I would stay up at night. Everyone was staying up to study, like to do math, like science, read, whatever. But I didn't have an interest in any of those. I would stay up just to draw. And in the morning, I'll bring the drawing to class. And then everyone, hey, Ibrahim has done a new drawing. Like those kind of things. We used to compete with one another. Like so, uh, we challenge actually. And then uh, someone will see, say, hey, Charlie, tomorrow, me too, I'll do something. Then the next day, someone too will bring one thing. So it always kept us on our, yes. But then if I didn't really do art in that way, if I, even if I, there was an artist in me and I, find my, I found myself in a science class, it wouldn't have been the same thing. So that was the day that I found that edge because there was a group of people who also shared that same uh, uh, feeling and mm -hmm. everyone wanted to be seen as the person who did what. And we could share techniques. Oh, I did the, the, Oh, how did you try this tone? Oh, I did this technique and that. Of course, every once in a while you find those who want to hide. Oh, uh, I won't show you. But today, a lot of them didn't become artists. You know, so <laughs> it's that thing. It's a sharing. We used to, like those that were willing to share, at least because when you share something, it's because you are insecure about it and you are willing to learn. And the more you share about it, the more it expands in you. But at a time, or even later on, you meet people that you thought that they would be willing to share what they have with you, but they don't want to share because they feel like if they share with you, you have an upper hand over them. But then that's the whole point about the world. The thing is that you might have an idea, but the idea might not be refined. It will take you to share it with someone else and the person immediately can connect because we have different experiences. And then now I can come back and then reshare it with you. And then the work that would have taken you 10 years, now someone would have refined it and given it back to you. Nice. Uh -huh. So that environment was important for me. And um, That the first point you made was so yeah. important, right? Because yeah. we tend to want to just hone our stuff and not yeah. share. And I think that is, that is really important because yeah. the reality is everybody will end up making it different. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Excellent. And Contributions to Red Clay. How do we contribute to what you're doing? I always like to say that we need more institutions, honestly, away from uh, red clay. The reason why I did it in Tamale was because the idea was that I wanted a space where you could think. I grew up in Accra, and at some point, it was impossible to think mm. here. Because when you have an idea... Because that cry is so fast and everyone wants to, like most people want to prove a point about something. Oh yeah, you want to show something. But for me, it wasn't so much about showing. It was about, it was about the work itself, you know. So I always encourage people that when they have an idea and they want to do something, they should somehow move outside the city center and experiment and do these things. And then in that form, they can actually reach certain audiences that normally they wouldn't have thought about. So certainly we need to be able to invest into building similar types of institutions across the country whether I've made proposals to build some of these in other places, in old buildings, all those pr proposals have been rejected and all that over countless years. But certainly, I think that there will be people, some of you, maybe your family owns a house somewhere, a land somewhere, something that you can do. I never had an interest in buying land in Accra for all the litigation issues and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, though in the north, it's not different because the chiefs there are catching up with uh, this, uh, <laughs> they're catching up with the gig. Uh, but still, still, I think that uh, as much as we try to do what we do, wherever we are, the only reason is that it should inspire all of us to find ways in which we can do these other things in little forms across the country. Yeah, so why not in Cape Coast? Why not in uh, Axim somewhere? Why not in somewhere in the Volta region? Yeah, so the question, it doesn't need to be big. It can just be like... Uh, small spaces that could actually spread these uh, these uh, institutional forms that we are trying to create or build. Yeah. Brahim, the last question was also mine. So I was going to ask it this way. I was going to ask you to close your eyes. Imagine that you're in 2035. 
And mm-hmm. what is next? <laughs> I literally want you to close. My mine sounds more sexy than the way the person puts it. So. <laughs> Um, Indulge yeah. me. No, but there is. Um... You did. <laughs> <laughs> his eyes are already closed. Eyes are closed. Imagine that his eyes, eyes are closed. Yes. There you go. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, I always, I always imagine that I could transform the red clay into like, um, into like an independent art school, mm. because in Ghana, Kuma, we had Ganata. Uh, we had the Achimota Art School also for like in the beginning. Kieran University has functioned for quite several decades and all that. But currently, uh, yeah, and there are also other arts programs that are being developed now in Winneba. Uh, I think University of Cape Coast. Winneba has always had an arts program, but geared towards education and all that. Yeah, and also Legon has the Faculty of Performing Arts. Right. Uh, yeah, Department of Performing Arts. But I've always thought that it's very important for us to have like independent art institutions that is actually dedicated to radical thoughts and work and practice. Yeah, so it's something that I've been quite dreaming about for quite a long time. And uh, the reason why I started building the railway in Tamale, the track, Mm -hmm. was because I thought that I could bring the memory of these objects into this space and zone and build them as uh, witnesses in a way, their audience. Imagine you went into you went to an art school or a school, but then the school itself is built on a tr- rail track that actually moves, moves. around the landscape, okay. or it's combined with architecture when works are installed on this platform. And the trains that I bought, some of them were like the old Gold Coast carriages. So like they were things that were literally used to transport gold, bauxite, and whatever. But this time, the weight that we are putting on it is actually like gifts. They're like imaginations and all that. And these things actually move. So each time you see it, you're not seeing it in a single space in time. You could see it in a farm. You could see it in a building. So it's not like the the, the invention of the white cube where in the modernist era, the, like the, the, the building is built, white walls, you put a painting on the wall. And then each time you come, the painting, the Mona Lisa is always in that single spot. Mm. Yeah, but the idea is that this thing is actually moving oh, through okay. the world as you yourself is moving through the world so it's um it's 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 a more conceptual approach that i've been looking at in relation to like uh, the expansion of architecture and all that so i'm trying to build an art school which will have like uh, a collection that would actually be part of a public trust and everything so i don't know how long that would take for it to be realized but like red clay i've been building it for nine years now so like this i think it will take another time maybe in the next 10 years it will be complete and i can finally uh, rest in my dreams but <laughs> <laughs> certainly i wish you well you'll be dreaming the next dream <laughs> ladies and gentlemen we thought we were coming to hear about art we've heard about history philosophy passion collaboration research discovery imagination vision flexibility workers hard work determination travel wow thank you Thank you. Thank you. It's really all I can say. As I close my little book, I would like to say a very big thank you to GIZ Ghana, to BMZ, to the European Union um, who funded this event. AHASPRA is a non for profit organization. Cough, cough. Anybody wants to help us out? Um, so we look for partners who help us. So thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been an amazing night. We're also very, very grateful to our strategic partners beyond the return, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. I don't see, I think they're here, um, who have always been partners to us and the work that we do. So we're really thank you, thankful for that. And most importantly, you, everyone in this room, you showed up, you stayed, the room is full and packed. People are standing in the back. People are online. And we've learned a lot. We've been enriched today. Um, Accra is hot. So you do sometimes just want to leave the heat behind you and come and empower yourself. And I think that is what we got to do tonight. And so we're very grateful. If the room was empty, it wouldn't be the same. So really, really thank you to all of you who came. There are some dignitaries here, but everybody's a dignitary. So um, as we say in Ghana, all protocols are absurd. But thank you so, so much. 
as you walk out the door and to your right, we have a reception. Please stay, hang out. That's what we do in a hospital. You hang out, you get to know people. You start building the partnerships right here. Uh, people have found jobs. They found husbands and wives and dogs. Uh, it, it all works right here. So again, thank you so much for an enriching night. I mean, I knew it would be phenomenal, but Ibrahim, you've taken us to another level. So now I only have to go higher than tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>